All right, we're going to get started with the next panel. It's uh, how to steal someone's implanted RFID and why you'd want to. Uh, it is hosted by number 26 and number 68. Uh, number 26 is uh, Annalie Newitt, who has been at previous conferences, used to work for the EFF, now works for Wired, um, and Jonathan West Hughes, who I met three minutes ago. Uh, Annalie has an RFID chip uh, implanted in her, uh, so when she goes through EasyPass, she gets charged twice. Um, so without further ado. Am I on? Am I on? Okay, actually I don't get charged through EasyPass because it's a totally different frequency, but um, maybe in the future. Um, okay, so basically uh, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I got um, an RFID implanted in my arm. Um, and then Jonathan West Hughes, who works at Merle and is an amazing um, hardware hacker, is going to talk about his device, the Proxmark 3, which he used to clone my implanted RFID. To my knowledge, this is the first time that somebody's actually cloned an implanted RFID, although certainly not the first time an RFID has been uh, cloned. Um, RFID, for those who don't know, I was told that the audience might not understand all acronyms, is Radio Frequency Identifier. Remember that, I'm never gonna tell you again. Um, so basically, uh, the question is, why, why and how did I get this RFID implanted in my arm? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about both. Um, when I tell people that I have an RFID in my body, um, there's usually an uninteresting question that comes after that, which is why would you do that? Um, I'm not interested in that question at all. Um, I think that RFIDs are going to become more and more ubiquitous. Um, I don't think it really matters why I chose to do it. What really does matter is why I chose to get this particular kind of RFID implanted in my arm. Um, there are a wide range of RFIDs that you can use. There's whole communities on the internet devoted to people talking about this. There's folks who've done all kinds of experiments with their implanted uh, RFIDs. So the question is, why did I pick an RFID, uh, which is a proprietary f uh, spec, which is not really interoperable with any off-the-shelf readers, um, and which is uh, <coughs> uh, therefore not terribly useful? So that's the question that I'm going to answer today. <coughs> uh, I just wanted to start briefly by running you through a very quick history of implanted RFIDs. RFID technology has argu arguably been around in some form since the 1950s and 60s. Um, it really wasn't commercialized until the 1980s. And then you didn't really see it being used very often until the 90s, which is right around the time that companies started marketing implantable RFIDs for pets and farm animals. Um, now, a lot of times when you adopt a cat or a dog um, or a mouse or whatever, a gerbil or something, um, you're given the option to get your pet uh, tagged. Usually it's not called an RFID. They usually say it's a, an under the skin chip or something like that. Um, but what it is is basically just an implantable RFID exactly like the one that I have in my body right now. So I am an implanted pet. Um, and Jonathan is never, never tires of pointing that out to me. Um, <coughs> and he'll talk to you more about that. Uh, but so uh, basically uh, an RFID that's implanted is a chip and an antenna inside of doped glass. So it's surgical glass. Um, it's usually, uh, depending on the animal that's being implanted, it could be quite big, like in a cow, it might be about this big, the size of a toonie if you're from Canada, um <coughs> the size of a 50 cent piece if you're from America. Um, and, uh, or it might be the size of the one that I got, which is basically, they always say, the size of a grain of rice. Um, it was in the late 90s that artist um, Eduardo Koch and the um, cyborg professor Kevin Warwick um, did the first public experiments with human implantation of RFIDs. Um, I think they basically used pet RFIDs, which had by that point been proven to be quite safe. Um, they don't tend to migrate under your skin, so they're pretty good. Uh, in that way, um, they don't really tend to develop too much scar tissue either. Um, then in 2000, 2001, uh, a company called Applied Digital announced that it would be marketing not just implantable RFIDs for your cuddly dog, but also for people. Um, immediately, uh, there was public outrage over it and pundits were saying, oh my God, that means we're going to be tracked. It's gonna be just like 1984. Um, <coughs> and uh, so far, that hasn't quite come to pass. 
Um, but Veritip, uh, which is a division of Applied Digital that markets tips for humans, um, has in fact been making some inroads into getting their tips uh, fairly widely, well, let's say fairly widely early stage deployed, which is to say they're, in, they're, they're testing these, RFI, these human implantable RFIDs in several different markets, one of which was uh, in around 2002, they were marketing them in Latin America to prevent um, people from being kidnapped, uh, which Jonathan and I, before this talk, were discussing like how exactly that would prevent kidnapping. We weren't really sure. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, you cut off their arm. I, so I, I said it was to, to prevent you know, someone from you know, growing a clone of you and replacing you or something like that. Um, but anyway, so that, that apparently that marketing didn't work. So now they're being marketed um, not just as um, kidnapping prevention devices, but as medical devices, basically implantable medical ID tags. Um, and uh, that's what Veritip is focusing on now, although they're also, as we'll get to in a second, focusing on them as access control devices, which is to say basically implanted smart cards. Um, there was a lot of media attention in 2004 when Veritip got FDA approval for its device. Uh, there's a widespread misunderstanding that what that means is that it's the only chip approved for human implantation. That's not true. The only reason why they got FDA approval was because they wanted to use it in a medical capacity. So it's the only RFID that's implantable that's approved for medical use. Uh, but there's a wide range of other kinds of RFIDs that you can use for implantation. Um, so let me, so I got a Vera chip. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why that is in a second. But let me tell you first a few things about the Verichip, and then Jonathan will get into more technical details later. Um, but basically, it's a pretty typical low-frequency chip. It's 134 kilohertz, which is kind of in the range of a lot of um, like uh, prox cards. Um, it contains a 16-digit read-only ID number. Um, and it's a passive RFID, which means it doesn't have its own power source, so it's powered by a reader. Um, and the read range is really, really small, um, which is to say it's not likely that someone could even read it, say, a foot away. But um, I think that they can get close enough that cloning them is quite possible. And in fact, we've proven that. One of the reasons I got the Vera chip, I don't know if, well, people will be able to read this. One of the reasons I got it was because the company was marketing them <coughs> uh, falsely, as it turned out, as the perfect access control device. This is from their website. I copied this a couple of days ago, so shockingly, they still have it on their website, despite the fact that both Jonathan and I have published articles uh, talking about the fact that they're lying. Um, but they say here on their website, Unlike conventional forms of identification, the Vera chip cannot be lost, stolen, misplaced, or counterfeited. It is safe, secure, reversible, and always with you. I don't know what the fuck reversible <laughs> means, reversible. Uh, you, if you turn your skin inside out or... <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but the thing that I really focused on here was the idea that it couldn't be counterfeited. Um, at the time I was researching, at the time I read this, I was researching an article for Wired Magazine, which has since come out, um, about uh, security and RFIDs. And I'd been reading uh, Jonathan's work as well as the work of um, uh, some folks at Johns Hopkins who had been working on cloning and skimming uh, prox cards as well as um, the ExxonMobil FastPass um, and some other RFID devices. And all of them had shown, basically, it's quite simple to clone an RFID. Uh, and I said to myself, well, can it be that Verichip has invented a foolproof, non-clonable RFID that's going to be implanted under my skin or under anyone's skin? You know, as a good investigative journalist, I need to find out more. Um, so I set out to get a Verichip implant, and I contacted Jonathan and asked him if I got one, would he be willing to try cloning it? And he said, yeah, even though it's kind of boring to clone a pet uh, <laughs> pet ID, um, but he was, he was willing to do it, which was very kind of him. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the process of getting Verichip to give me an implant, which, was, which is a story uh, which is very um, amusing and tells you a lot about their business practices. Uh, Verichip claims that they have about two dozen doctors who are um, somehow affiliated with the company and have been trained to do these implants. The implant process is quite simple, and I'll tell you in a second. Um, and so I looked through their list of doctors who had been trained uh, and found one, uh, Alan Pantuck, who is a really nice guy, works at UCLA Medical Center. 
um, and called him up and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to get one of these implants. Can you set me up? And he said, what are you, what are you talking about? I, I'm not approved to do Verichip implant. What? What? And I said, well, but you're, you're listed here on, on the Verichip website as an approved doctor and they have your name and address and phone number right here. And he says, well, it's true that I once went to their website and I did register for the website and did mention that I was a doctor. Um, huh. <laughs> And, and I said, well, apparently you're approved, so do you have some chips? Can you hook me up? And he said, uh, no, um, but uh, sure, if you want me to stick one in, I'll, I'll do it, no problem. And it turned out he um, had actually already done uh, the implant for Mikey Sklar, who you might have heard of, who does um, the uh, Faraday cage pants and lots of other interesting tricks with RFID. So he was happy to do it. Um, so I contacted Verichip and I said, hey, come on get this guy, you know, he, this guy's on your website as an approved vendor, so you should give him a, a kit to implant this stuff. And they hemmed and hawed for a couple of months. And so finally, the day that I had booked my ticket to go down to LA to get the implant, they literally had just FedExed the equipment to him that morning. So his entire training in getting a Verichip implant was receiving the box about two minutes before he did the procedure. Um, this isn't me getting the procedure. I haven't actually had a sex change since, since getting my Verichip. Um, but uh, this, is, this is exactly what happens. Um, they're, all Verichips are supposed to be implanted in your arm. So the idea is so that when hospitals bring you in and you're unconscious, they know where to look for it. Um, they use a bit of lidocaine to numb your skin and a cannulated needle, which is just a needle that's hollowed out. And they stick the chip, which is about the size of, they always say, a grain of rice. And indeed, it is the size of a grain of rice. Um, and they just shoot it in. And um, it didn't really hurt, partly because I was numb, but um, I didn't bleed. It was very easy. Um, went home with a Band-Aid. Um, and now I have a number. And there's my, my ID number, so if you want to steal my identity, <laughs> feel free. Um, but in fact, as you'll find out, um, it's quite easy. That's my actual arm, and that's the actual Band-Aid I went home with. Um, <laughs> and uh, as you'll find out um, when, when Jonathan um, clones my chip in a few minutes, um, one of the things about the Verichip, this allegedly non-counterfeitable, completely secure access device, um, is that it has absolutely no security controls on it whatsoever. Um, so it's basically just a, an ID number being sent in the clear. Fantastic for a lock. Fantastic for a lock, that it, for a key that is now stuck in your arm forever. Um, the process of getting the um, RFID out of your arm is actually really painful and sucky. So I probably won't actually ever take it out. Um, you know, they stick it in with the needle, um, but then in order to get it out, they kind of have to cut you open and like dig around because it's really small. You can like barely feel it if you, lots of people always like want to touch my arm and say like, can I feel it? But you can't really. So, um, so I'm not going to get it taken out because I don't care that much um, and I don't want them kind of digging around on my arm. So anyway, um, I just wanted to mention briefly before we go to the demo, um, a couple of objections that are often raised to RFIDs and specifically to implantable RFIDs, which I think for good reason really um, punch people's buttons and kind of raise even more alarm, uh, even more, even greater sense of alarm than I think RFIDs in clothes, for example, or in other devices. So the first question that's always raised is, aren't RFIDs an invasion of privacy? And I think, yes, they can be, and that's certainly a good question to ask. But a more important question to ask is what kinds of security are, is available on the RFID that we're talking about and how much the user has control over that security. And so what I urge people to do who are experimenting with RFIDs and who are lobbying for laws that regulate RFIDs and who are interested in the technology is not to pose questions about privacy because often the answer to the question about privacy is, yes, they're privacy invasive, we should get rid of RFIDs. Well, that's not gonna happen. We're not going to get rid of them. There's too much money invested in them. Walmart alone, which is, has like the GDP of like a small country, uh, is now deploying RFIDs throughout its uh, supply chain. So you're never going to get rid of them. But what we can do is push companies and push governments to create RFIDs that have decent security controls on them. Um, and there's all different ways in which that might happen. You might get chips with really strong crypto on them for things like... Um, car keys, uh, where you really want to make sure that someone can't clone it, 
Or you might have something as simple as if you're using an EPC tag in a piece of clothing, make it so that someone can cut it out with scissors, put it into the tag so that someone has control over what happens to that RFID tag and label anything that has an RFID tag on it. Um, so that's really where I think we should be pushing, is not pushing to get rid of RFIDs, but pushing to have better security under the user's control. Um, <clears throat> the other question that gets asked a lot and was asked when I went on Democracy Now! with uh, Liz McIntyre, the very friendly but a little bit alarmist author of Spy Chips, um, <clears throat> who has a special edition of Spy Chips just for Christians. Um, uh, you know, the, the radio host asked, what would Hitler have done with RFIDs? Um, well, the answer is the exact same thing he did without RFIDs. Um, I don't think that genocidal dictators need RFIDs in order to kill minority groups. History has shown us that genocide can work just fine in an extremely analog, low-tech environment. So I really think that when that question gets raised, it really just has to be kind of dismissed and, and say, like, look, that's not the issue. Really, the issue here is user-controlled security. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, just to finish up, uh, a few examples of people who I think have been doing interesting experiments with implanted ID RFIDs um, <clears throat> and who are sort of taking this idea of challenging the security of RFIDs and publishing about it. Um, there's Amal Grofstra, uh, whose book uh, RFID Tricks is really fun. He has two implanted RFIDs. Uh, one of them, which is pictured here in the slide that I'm showing, um, the Philips HiTag S2048 chip, does have some security functions and he's playing around with that and writing about it right now. Um, he has a great website. Um, another type of experiment that's being done with RFIDs is using them in art. Uh, Mikey Sklar, who I mentioned earlier, who created the Faraday cage pants, where if you put anything in the pocket, um, it blocks people's ability to read the RFID marked items um, in your pocket, um, has also created uh, something called the Highlighter Project, which is a trampoline that's activated by the RFID in your hand, um, well, not the trampoline, but the giant flame of fire that's then activated by the trampoline. So you activate the fire with the RFID, then you get on the trampoline, and the higher you jump, the bigger the fire. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, he's been building RFID reading into his art for a long time, and he's always at Burning Man. So if you go to Burning Man and you see a flaming trampoline thing, that's Mikey. Um, however, art and experimentation aside, uh, the thought I want to end with is, you know, if we continue down this path with companies like Verichip lying to people about the security of their RFID products and uh, government trying to um, put RFIDs that are not secure into ID tags, um, you know, that's the time when we need to take matters into our own hands and start hacking the shit out of this stuff and publishing about it. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I would think, you know, we'd want to cheer harder for hacking, but that's okay. Um, I hate people who are like, cheer more. No, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, an early morning or afternoon cheer for hacking. So the thought I want to end with is, you know, when you see these kinds of things going on with um, RFIDs being presented uh, that don't have adequate security and that's not under user control, it's time to start hacking in your garage and um, or in your workshop. And so with no further ado, I will segue to the awesome hacker, Jonathan West Hughes. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the technical aspects of this. Um, th this is going to be less impressive than you might think. Um, <laughs> So RFID is used commercially, like, like as, as a branding thing as, and as a marketing thing for a lot of different technologies. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to use the word RFID to mean passive RFID. That is to say, some little device that communicates over, but also is powered over the air. Um, so thermodynamics teaches us that there is a deep connection between energy and information. If you want to transmit information, then you do that with some amount of energy. So when your cell phone transmits, you know, it, it's 4.615 milliseconds of your voice over the air, it does that by taking some energy out of the battery, putting it in the antenna, and some of that goes into the antenna at the base station, and your voice comes along for the ride. 
but you can also send energy over the air just for the sake of energy. An example of that would be a microwave oven. It operates at the same frequency as your wireless LAN card, but the, the effect's a bit different. So this is the same sort of trick that is pulled by a passive RFID tag. Some of the energy that is sent over the air is used to represent information. For example, the reader is requesting a specific page of memory from the tag, but some of it also just goes to power the tag, and then the tag makes its DC bus and, and it runs its little microprocessor the same as it would if that energy came out of the battery. So this is not new. Um, the, Maxwell would have understood the fundamentals, at least, of a system like this. Practical implementations, of course, had to wait until we could build meaningful radio frequency electronics. A, well, an early example of RFID was conceived of by none other than Theremin of electronic music fame. Um, in 1946, the ambassador or, or some high-ranking diplomat of the United States to Russia was presented with a carved great seal of the United States uh, by, by school children. Um, very good, and, and it was a nice carving. Um, I, I've seen pictures, it's beautiful. And, and you know, the, the ambassador can also recognize good wood carving when he sees it. So, you know, sweep it for bugs, seems okay, and, and hang it up in your office. Uh, it wasn't until six years later that they happened to disassemble it and find inside of it an antenna and a microphone, but, but nothing else. So, so it works by the same principle, right? Like you, the, the KGB parks the van outside, you, you beam the, the 350 megahertz in the window and you listen for the voice on the back scattered radio channel. It, it's an RFID bug. And, and this is in the days of vacuum tubes. Um, obviously, we've come a long way since then. The development of modern integrated circuits, modern transistors, modern IC processes has made this practical. So for, you know, the past 20-ish years, you've been able to buy relatively simple RFID tags. These tags don't perform any kind of mathematical operation on the tag itself. No crypto. Um, no fancy state machines. Basically, they have some ID. It's a fixed number of bits, usually on the order of 100. When they're in the field, they repeat it over and over and over, and, and, and that's it. But, but this is good for a number of things. Um, the majority of proximity cards on the market, for example, work in this way. And you've been able to buy parts um, that are more or less like this in a number of different packages as well. I mean, you can get them as a flat proximity card. You can get them as like little disc-shaped things to screw to something. And you can get them as glass encapsulated things for, for use in harsh environments where, where they will get wet or exposed to solvents or whatever. Um, so, so, you know, given some piece of human or animal flesh and, and given this RFID tag sheathed in biocompatible glass, I, I mean, it doesn't take very long to figure out that, that yes, you can probably put this in, into that and, and nothing bad will happen afterwards and the RFID tag will continue to work and, and, and you know, now you have implantable RFID. And, and people have done this in animals for a while. That This isn't a great innovation. They've basically taken yet another RFID tag, the, the same as your Motorola FlexPass proximity card, or, or the same as you know some sort of ill-fated asset tracking thing, and they have implanted it instead into your house pet. So okay, now you can return your house pet, and, and you know someone can return it when it gets lost, and, and you know it can't get lost like a collar would, and that's not a bad idea. Fairly practical. But, but of course, you know, humans are animals too. So if there's products on the market 
th that are already basically designed for animal use. I, I mean, it, it, it's not a really great leap to think that yes, you could implant this in, into a human as well. Um, so people have done this. Um, Annalie, of course, ran through the first few people who have done it, but, but I mean, th these days you're, you're just not a credible futurist without at least one of them implanted. Um, so the, the, there's a lot of people out there with a show of hands or, <laughs> oh well. Um, no one in this room has an RFID implant? How many people in the room know somebody who has an RFID implant? <laughs> it, it cost me about $400 to get mine done, but that's because I got it done at a medical center. So I think people are, I mean, it's 20 bucks for a chip, uh, for one that has good crypto, and for a crappy one, it's like five bucks. Well, yeah, and, and I mean the medical portion of it. Th th this isn't like the latest in biotech. I mean, a good piercing artist can do this for you with no trouble. Um, it, it's not that exciting. Um, so, so people have done this, the, the attention seekers, the artists, the, the whatevers, and, and you know, like, if you want to do something that will cause the reporters to return your calls, and you want it to involve RFID, and you want to do this knowing as little about RFID as possible, that then getting yourself implanted is actually a pretty good move. I mean, I can't think of anything better. So people have done this, um, and, and Verychip has done this as well. So, so I think that the latest trend for the individual experimenters is to use, there, there's this one web store that sells a kind of a development kit. Um, it is like a few hundred bucks and then you can get yourself started. Then, you know, you get your plastic surgeon or you get your piercing artist or, or you can even do it yourself. I've seen web pages from people who did and took pictures. But it, it's not that hard. In Verichip's case, their parent company makes pet tags. So you can kind of guess what they did, right? Well, it, it worked in the cat, so let's try it in a person. And, and of course it worked. Um, it, it's a very rational thing to do. If you take a very chip, though, and you go to read it with a pet tag reader, then I'm told, I haven't tried it, that it won't read. And, and similarly, if you take a pet tag and, and you, know, you do it the other way, th then it won't read. But, but that's very easy to do without incurring any major new development expenses. The tag just repeats an ID, some bit stream, out of memory. It doesn't really know which of those bits are the checksum or which of them are the header and so on. So if you just mess with the format a little bit, no new development expenses, but you have a whole new seeming family of tags. So, so this is cheap, like, like we're talking, you know, low six figures, high five figures. I, I mean, if you, you can set yourself up in, in the highly professional human implantable RFID business for, you know, a fraction of the cost of a house in Boston. Do you, do you want to just point out, we, we actually, dug around a little bit and got proof that Verichip does indeed um, have a parent company called Digital Angel that produces pet tags. So this is Digital Angel, and here's an article from 2000 where Digital Angel talked about getting uh, an implant not just for keeping tabs on pets, for worldwide use in tracking human beings. So they don't talk about that now, but indeed history does show that pet tags and human tags are the same. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the very chips business model is not really product design, but product repurposing. They, they take the IP that has been developed for use in house pets and they apply it to people. And, and when I say they take the IP, I mean that they take the, the same like piece of silicon. The, there's you know, no new chip being designed. There, there's no expensive development. It, it, it's not effectively a pet tag that they're implanting in, in you, or it's not like something that tracks you as if it were a pet tag. It, it's the same part number. It's a pet tag. And, and, and yes, they're, they're doing an IPO for like 40 something million dollars. But the, the problem, of course, with this is that, I, I mean, now I'm supposed to talk about security, but if you're designing a product yourself, then you can design the security. 
but if you're repurposing a product, then the security just happens. You sort of get whatever the designer of the original product seemed to think would be useful in his application. So for a pet tag, th there's just no need for any kind of security. I, I mean, like, in, in, unless you imagine some sort of problem with counterfeit house pets, there, there's just no conceivable <laughs> way that you, you can justify the expense in adding cryptographic security to the product. But now Verichip comes along and, okay, let's use it in people. Well, now it's implanted in people. What can they do with it? Well, what can they do with it that pets don't do? Well, pets don't buy things. People buy things. Um, so, okay, we'll make a payment system out of it. So, so you can, you know, walk into a bar, you can, you know, you know, scan your hand or your arm or wherever it's implanted and, and you can buy yourself a drink with that. Well, okay, but at, at this point, you know, before, okay, you, you could clone someone's house pet. You, you could steal their pet and replace it with an exact replica without <laughs> performing surgery on the original pet. N not a problem. But, you know, Im imagine some sort of, of dystopian future where we all get the things implanted at birth and, and we use them to, to buy our groceries each week. Well, in that case, I could push through a subway car with a, a handheld reader and, and I could steal effectively, you know, a few dozen people's identities at a go. So, so it obviously breaks down completely. Um, if you read Verichip's website, they, they have quite grandiose future plans. Uh, they talk about, well, using it to make purchases, as I said. They also talk about various uh, less specified things. They want to stick them into all immigrants. They want to stick them into soldiers. Uh, the soldiers is particularly good, like, I, I mean, you know, a, a machine readable tag that distinguishes your personnel from theirs, that that's going to be really useful to, to, you know, the, the Iraqi designers of mines, right? Okay, okay, so now you're going to say, no, no, the read range isn't long enough for, for that to happen. Well, okay, if the read range isn't long enough for that, then why is it useful? And, and, and you can play these games. But, but I, I mean, the, the technology is just absent. It's a pet tag. It's an RFID chip that could have been designed when I was in elementary school. So, so to you know, Im imagine that, that very chip at least is going anywhere with human implantable RFID it is technically, I think, a bit of a stretch. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. People do all sorts of interesting things involving implantable RFID. Like if you drop by a biotech lab, you'll see, for example, various bits of monitoring equipment that they stuff into lab animals. And those things are huge. Um, like it's, it's amazing how much you can fit into a mouse and, and still have room left for the mouse. But, well, but lab animals don't live that long anyways. So, but you know, you can get things that monitor various vital signs breathing, core temperature, a lot of things. Um, because, you know, there's people putting serious technical effort into designing a product to solve a problem. In, in, in the case of the very chip, you're, you're just sort of, hey, cool, we can, we can stick it into a person instead. So nothing particularly special happens. Um, so now I'll do the demo because everyone likes a demo. Yes, so let us switch laptops. Now you'll get to see Jonathan clone my chip. This, pr this experiment was originally, originally took place in a small coffee shop in Cambridge. <laughs> Which has since gone out of business, so oh. it was really lousy. But. Yeah, well they had, I, I thought the french fries and coffee idea was a good, yeah. good idea. <laughs> But may maybe not. <laughs> so to start with, let's read Annalise's tag. I have Verichip's legitimate reader. So like the, the, this is the thing that they've been giving out to emergency rooms and so on to, so that they can scan you when you come in unconscious, you know, on the off chance that you're one of the like 100 people who have had the thing Im implanted. So th this is also, as I understand it, the actual hardware that they used in some of their commerce deployments. Like, like the, you know, the waiter was manually typing in your code because, 
well because the deployment was a gimmick so there was no sense building anything better. But anyways, let's read Anna Lee. It's kind of slow. Okay, so that beep that you didn't hear indicated that it read successfully. So currently it's displaying her Verichip ID, which is 1022, then a lot of zeros, then 47063. We have no idea what that means. It's just a unique identifier. It literally is just a number. They're just, yeah. Um, so now let me read her arm using my RFID tag reader. You'll see a couple of dots on my arm if you're close enough. That's just because we wanted to mark the spot where my RFID is. If there's, those aren't like a result of the RFID. So what I'm holding against her arm here is the reed antenna. Um, in, in this case, d depending on the, the structure of the antenna of the tag, you'll use a slightly different reed antenna. In this case, um, perhaps you saw it on the slide where we had a picture of the tag close up. The antenna on the tag is a ferrite rod, like, like fairly long and skinny with windings on it. In this case, the, the reed antenna sort of resembles the, the tag antenna. So, so that's kind of comforting. And, and this is what works best. So I've read it now. Um, let me download the sample. Jonathan designed this himself, by the way. So you can see that we've received a signal that has some structure to it. Um, uh, th this is basically a, a plot of received voltage versus time, or, or you know, received electric field in the air versus time, whatever you'd like to think of it as. And, and it uses some particular modulation scheme to represent a particular bit as a particular waveform over the air. And, and you know, the reason why you choose some particular modulation scheme is, is to represent the data in a way that is readily sent over the radio link. And in Verichip's case, it, it's dead simple. It's some kind of Manchester thing. I haven't looked into it very deeply because to clone her ID, there's no need for me to look into it very deeply. I just have to replay whatever the tag sent because it's one-way communications, no cryptographic security, no back and forth. The tag transmits the same time thing each time. It, it's as simple as it could be. Uh, so what I do then is I represent the trace in some more convenient way to replay. The, this is another representation of the exact same trace that I just read. And then I can uh, put this device, this reader that I'm using, in a different mode in which it replays an ID. So, it, so it's behaving like a tag instead of behaving like a reader. Low sim, low frequency, simulate. So now I'll take the very chip reader. Once again, it takes a few moments to power up. And, and same number, right? 47063. You can come see it afterward if you want. Thank you. Um, so, um, I can do much more impressive things. I mean, th this reader is designed. Th this reader is designed with signal processing hardware to do like the 13.56 megahertz tags. Um, I I've written DSP code. To d I can do a lot more than clone a pet tag with it. But, well, that that's what she came with, so. <laughs> I told you I'm a pet. Um, so what you have to imagine, I think, in this situation is that you wouldn't have two nice people sitting up here uh, doing this, but if he did want to do some kind of attack on someone who is using one of these chips for um, access control, and there are companies that are using the chips now for essentially keys to get into uh, secure areas of their company. The exact same as a proximity card. 
Yeah, yeah so except it's in you. Yeah, so all he'd have to do is basically like brush up against me in an elevator. One of the beauty parts of Verichips is that the company requires that they always be installed in the same part of your body. So <laughs> great. So now an attacker knows they're always in this part of your arm. Um, so it would be quite simple for him to break into um, a company like City Watcher in Cincinnati that puts all of their um, secure data in a room that you can only access using your completely secure, non-counterfeitable Verichip. Actually, they were smart enough to make that only an interior door. Um, so, so, you know, they, they weren't fooled. They knew it was a gimmick install. You so. hope, yeah. So should we do QA now or? Uh, yeah, let's. Um, if you have a question, can you line up at the mic because they're recording everything you say and they want to hear? <laughs> what would you recommend at companies use as an alternative technology? For implantation? Yeah, for unique ID implantation. Um, you know, right now Philips, as I said, um, Amal Grofstra is experimenting with the Philips high tag, um, which does have some crypto on it. I don't know how good it is. Um, so I think at this point, there aren't a lot of decent implantable tags with security uh, features, but well, that would be where I'd start. What, what would you say? There, there's the, I mean, if I were, if I, if for some, I, I don't know why I would want to implant myself with an RFID tag, but if I did want to do so and I wanted Just to- Just pretend. Yeah, and, and I wanted to be cryptographically secure. It's my understanding that there, is the, there are the Desfire cards out there which are not available in glass capsules, but could be repackaged pretty easily. I, I mean, th this is the kind of thing, you know, you can't do it in your kitchen, but you can do it with like thousands of dollars of equipment, not hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and those use, well, DES, which is at, at least a known quantity. Yeah, That's and Texas Instruments do. has said that they're gonna do 128-bit um, encryption in their next generation of tags, which are supposed to be used in car keys, uh, but they, those are not on the market yet, and I, I talked to a rep that told me that who knew I was writing about security, so <laughs> I don't know how true it is, but. Uh, I heard you mention about, uh, you, were t you were talking about RFIDs with encryption, um, and it's my understanding that RFIDs with encryption, even up to, let's say, two or three levels, are double or triple or even quadruple the price of a typical RFID chip. Do you really think that the companies are going to expend that amount of money on something like that? Um, I, you are correct that uh, they do cost a lot more money to manufacture. Um, the price will be coming down, uh, just as the price of RFIDs has dropped off precipitously in the last few years. And I think that um, if we can push companies to do that for applications that require it, um, I think we, I think it is reasonable to expect that you know consumers might demand that a company use uh, excellent encryption in an RFID that's in their car keys. Um, like I said, for applications that require it, I think it's right. For an EPC tag on gum, no, mm. that's ridiculous. It's, so um, you don't. I mean, do you think they would use as an alternative maybe an active? Um, RFID versus uh, passive. Well, uh, it's possible. Let, that's yeah. Go, you answer that. Well, let, let, because I mean, you just probably some of you already know this, but there, there's basically two considerations that make cryptography expensive in an RFID tag. The first one is basically die area, the cost of of the silicon to make the transistors to implement the, this more sophisticated state machine, be, because obviously a state machine that can calculate, you know, an AES or of whatever is going to be a lot more complex than one that can just read an ID out of ROM. So, so that is the same consideration that would be present whether the tag were powered over the air or whether it were powered off a battery or whether it plugged into the wall. But the additional consideration is that RFID tags are powered over the air. This means that every microwatt is precious because the amount of power that you require determines the amount of power that the reader must supply to you and that determines your read range, more or less. But again, for something like a car key transmitter, you're actually in a pretty good situation from a read range standpoint because you're right on top of it, basically. Yeah. 
So in that case, you really wouldn't get any kind of gain in going to an active tag as opposed to a passive one because what's driving the cost is the die area, yeah. not the yeah, exactly. The not military the is looking a lot into using active tags because they want to have greater read ranges, mostly for equipment and things like that. But also with an active tag, um, battery life is a consideration too because they, they die. So yeah. they become useless after a while. So. Yeah. So I'm worried about the case that we do have secure RFIDs, and then is it easy to have a, a device, a, a surgical device, where somebody kidnaps you, take the RFID physically from you, and then implant it in himself and run? So is it, so I'm, I'm thinking about physical security for RFIDs. Physical security for implanted RFIDs. Yes, yes, yes. I don't want to, I mean, well, I, I'm afraid that somebody will t take this and kill yeah. someone but because, to, to take it out. But if it's very easy to sort remove. Sort of a, a Philip K. Dick future where you, people cut off your arm to have your well, RFID. Well, if it's very, quite easy in the sense that yeah. you don't need to cut somebody's arm and at the gunpoint you just remove this and yeah. stick it on somebody else. So do you know or? Um, nobody in the implantable RFID space is looking that forward yet. I mean, as we said, you know, the only you know, human implantable RFID that's being marketed has, I mean, is sending their ID in the clear. So obviously they're not too worried about security or well, they're that, lying about security, okay. basically. And, and I mean, you have to understand that, that, you know, human implantable RFID at the moment comprises, you know, art projects, uh, attention seeking and, and sort of demo deployments that aren't really used from Yeah, Veritech. they're not widespread yet. So, you know, it, at the moment, it just doesn't come up because, I, I mean, you know, we were looking for some cool thing to do now that we can clone a Vera chip. You know, like maybe we can open a door somewhere or, or, I, or I can buy a drink on her tab. But it, it's really hard to find someone who's actually using them for something. So. But I would say just, just to, to have a science fictional moment, I mean, you could imagine if somebody did want to have physical security in a future where this stuff actually achieved widespread deployment, which is still questionable, um, you could have an RFID tag that was um, somehow uh, sensitive to body temperature. So if it were taken out of your body, for example, um, you know, maybe that would uh, cause it to kill itself, basically. But, you know, there'd be ways around that, too. You just keep it warm once you take it out. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's the stuff of science fiction at this point. Um, but, and of course, everyone has heard of the case of the fingerprint print reader on the car and, and the rather gruesome car theft that, I think that one made the rounds, but, so it's the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, they were being used by hospitals, they were scanning for people. Um, what information are they gathering off the current ID tags? Uh, the way that the system works, again, the number on the Verichip is just a unique ID, so, once the, well, I, I'm, I, I won't pull it up because it's probably confidential. I have the protocol that one hospital has written for it. Um, and then when, when it was included in a journal article, one of the reviewers complained about all the spelling mistakes in it. But and anyways, the <laughs> hospital will try to read you, then they will type the number that they read into some network accessible database run by Verichip. And, and that basically pulls up like a little scrapbook of, of whatever you chose to provide. And you pay, um, to have that service, you pay per month to have your medical records in their database. And this just brings up another issue with RFIDs that um, neither of us touched on, which is that the security of your RFID is really in the database where all the information is being kept, because most RFIDs give off a simple number that's then correlated to a database. And so then a lot of these security issues wind up really being database security issues, which is something that we understand fairly well. So, um, and certainly in the case of Verichip, that's what you're talking about is a, a database uh, concern there. You actually stole my question. I was gonna ask you about, uh, do you ever foresee coupling this technology? I mean, as it stands right now, it's pretty crappy. It's just a you know, small number. But this technology could be modified to just give a longer key so it could be your public key, for example, and in a, th a three-way system, it could be have something, or in this case, be something, like a pet, and, uh, and then know something, which would be your PIN number, stored in a database. Do you, do you see this technology without, without two-way RFID chips being expanded to maybe encompass something like uh, how ATM cards are currently being used? 
Um, it could be. I mean, there's already RFID chips on the market, like the ones that are used in library books that can hold a lot of data and they're right. writable. Um, so you could conceivably actually have um, a fairly lengthy no key in there. Um, right. The biggest issue with public keys is trust. Is it yours? Yeah. And, you know, if so you, if it's if you in have your it in body, you, it's then pretty good. It's assumption. pretty good. But I mean, what's Whoa. the difference between that and just meeting in a room and calling out your number and saying, hello, I'm here. This is really me. There, there is none. Yeah. yeah. So why would you do it? <laughs> I mean, it's fun. No, I admit it's fun. So there's the fun factor. But I think, um, you know, will it be used for that? I don't know. I mean, I think both Jonathan and I are pretty dubious about the fact about whether these will be deployed widely at all because they're so crappy at this point. But maybe. Thank Possibly, you. yeah. I see they're telling you to stop. Yep. Yeah, can we do one more question or should we? Okay, one more question. Um, my only question is, is it possible for the RFID to actually move around in your body? I mean, um, or is it just right under the skin and it won't get in your bloodstream? And it's you right under the skin. It will not get into your bloodstream. It goes into the f sort of fatty area. Um, there, it's very unlikely to move around. Um, it's much smaller than, say, a nor plant, which there's a lot of research on nor plants about whether they migrate and whether they scar and stuff like that. Um, if you don't know what a nor plant it is, look it up on the interwebs. Um, so, uh, so I don't think that there's any evidence that they move around. They could, and they could get scarred, but um, you know, more research needs to be done. More people need to be implanted. Or but again, not. from a, from a medical standpoint, none of this is really that. It exciting. It, it, it's a body yeah, piercing. It's, it's doped glass in your body. It's like, you know, people have way more exotic shit in their bodies. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Coming up next in this room is Mag Stripe Tech and the MetroCard in five minutes.